Hello, and welcome to a special edition of Up Close on METV. I'm Charles Clapsaddle, Station Manager for Manatee Educational Television, and it is our great privilege to have with us today Representative Jim Boyd. Representative Boyd, thank you so much for joining us, sir, and I thank know you, that Charles. you have a very busy schedule, but we really appreciate you taking the opportunity to give this community an update on the end of session. So, at the end of the session, how do, how do you think it went? Well, uh, first of all, thanks again, Charles, for having, having me over today. I always appreciate uh, the time that you give us and, and the opportunity to let our friends and neighbors know what kind of was going on and has gone on in Tallahassee. Uh, it's great to be home, first of all. Uh, as you know, I think we talked about last, uh, before the session, uh, we were up there early this year. We were there mm -hmm. January and February. We're, typically, we're there in March and April. So we're finished, uh, hopefully, for the year. And uh, it was a wild and lively session, a lot really was. was accomplished. A lot, you know, left kind of on the table, so to speak, undone right. that perhaps we can take another look at next year. But I think we, on balance, accomplished a great deal for the state of Florida, tried to do what was right, tried to think about the economy and jobs and some of the big issues that we still face as, as a state and, and tried to tackle some issues that were relevant to those, uh, to those uh, key initiatives. Well, this session, I think you nailed it right on the head. It was, they had a lot of stuff on their plate this year. It was a budget, it was redistricting, there were some major, major issues. Um, but the House was, uh, got along pretty well. There was a lot of things that the House did that, were, that came together in a very uh, civil manner, uh, unlike other uh, areas. <laughs> of, but one of the things, the key thing that is the, the, the legislature is mandated with, is to produce a balanced budget each and every year. And that's a tough task in, in these economic times. Tell us a little bit about the budget process and some of the things that specifically happened, how to help that budget get balanced. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, as you indicated, constitutionally, we have to do the budget every year, and that's our only constitutional mandate other than every 10 years, the redistricting, which I think we'll talk about mm -hmm. in a few minutes. But uh, the budget, again, another tough year. You know, we went up facing a maybe a $2 billion shortfall in revenue. Exactly. Um, there were some that wanted to wait a little bit later to see if, you know, revenue uh, revenues increased over the spring and maybe made our task a little bit easier. But our leadership and our body, I think, felt like, no, we've got to deal with what we know. And what we know is the numbers that we have. Mm -hmm. And then if things do get better, you know, you can always make adjustments down the road. So uh, again, another year of tough decisions. Last year, my first year, uh, we had a $4 billion hole. So I guess you could look at it like it was getting better, but $2 billion is still a pretty big number by, by anybody's standards. Exactly. But I think, uh, you know, we, the House and the Senate, uh, produced a budget that, um, by and large, it, it was pretty fair and pretty good. You know, certainly there are those that uh, were hurt and impacted by it, mm -hmm. but I think what the House tried to do, and I think the Senate as well, tried to look across the board and not, you know, make cuts that were draconian in one area and exactly. not do anything in another area. So we tried to be as, as fair and as balanced as we could. Some good things, I think, came out of it. And mm -hmm. um, you know, we got another billion dollars in education. That's a key initiative of, of our leadership and I think of the governor's. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those are some good things. And locally, we were able to uh, do some things that are good for our community as well as this region. Mm -hmm. uh, South Florida, Sarasota campus, I think, is uh, gonna receive another couple million dollars mm -hmm. to help them along some of the initiatives that they're on. Uh, MTI that we worked hard on last year and, and got a, about a million nine last year, an increase toward equity. We're not asking for more than we deserve as a community. Exactly. We're just saying compare us fairly with other communities in the state. We didn't get a lot more this year for MTI, another 100,000 or so, but another step toward equity, I think, in that system, which is important. So we still have a ways to go there. But um, overall, you know, I don't think anybody got hurt really, really bad, mm -hmm. but some tough choices had to be made because you only have so many dollars that you can deal with and you just have to figure out how to apply them fairly across the board. I think the, the, the one key thing that, you know, that came out of this was returning money back into education because the previous year there was a cut to the education mm -hmm. funding. And uh, but Governor Scott made it very, very clear at the kind of the onset that he wanted to put money back in to the education for Florida schools. And recently we had the superintendent of schools, Dr. McGonigal here, and he said it's a really a great step in the right direction uh, to do that. 
a billion dollars throughout the whole state of Florida, you know, will go so far is to raising that kind of um, a parity uh, with all the states. And that's a big, big step. I think, I think it's a big step. You know, obviously, uh, you know, you could spend more, but on the other side, you know, there could be less. But uh, I think uh, our school district and others are looking at student performance and, and what classroom uh, monies are spent to really educate students. And I think that's what it's all about. And as we look at the big picture, I hope we never lose sight of what's really important, and that's educating our young people for tomorrow and, uh, and uh, what lies ahead of them in their, in their lives and their careers. So it's really important. It's a, it is a key initiative, I think, of leadership in our state. And I think we'll continue to look at that year in and year out. And another thing, recently at a Chamber of Commerce uh, event, the uh, board of directors from MTI appreciated the efforts that the legislature, the local legislative delegation made into getting that parity for MTI. And it, it, for a long time there wasn't that equity, now there is. We still, yeah, thank you. We still have a ways to go. Uh, you know, as I think we talked about perhaps even last time we were together, some communities are 115 percent of what they deserve. We were in the 70s, uh, you know, and we're moving, we're moving toward uh, equity and, and across the state, I think leadership on education committees and appropriations are uh, really understanding the need to bring that into parity across the board. So we're not done, you know, in terms of what we can do for our community and others like ours that are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of below the bar, so to speak. So we'll continue to work at that. Now, one of the great efforts and the mandate that the governor has had is putting people back to work. I think during his campaign, he says, we want to have 700,000 people employed. We want to reduce the rate of unemployment in Florida. And he's made some steps in that direction and added monies this year to kind of increase employment awareness. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, it has been a key initiative of his and, and many in, in the legislature um, on both sides of the aisle, which is very encouraging. You know, we all uh, all 120 House members understand the need to get uh, people back to work and get our economy uh, kind of booming again. And I think there are some, you know, some direct monies that have been spent by the governor's office, the uh, Enterprise Florida and the, uh, some of the uh, uh, attendant uh, divisions in, in Tallahassee right. to that have all been kind of consolidated into one. So, you know, you go one place to get a decision made versus this Three silo and that silo and you know you have to wait and wait and wait so uh, not only have, have there been money spent but there's also been some regulations and, and some bureaucracies that have been kind of broken down mm -hmm. you know we still have regulations that you have to comply with to do business in Florida but our goal and I think the governor's as well has been to lessen the regulations lessen the burdens not just on businesses but on families as well keep you know, in place what's necessary. So we live in a controlled and mm -hmm. <laughs> organized society, but by the same token, government shouldn't be, uh, you know, an impediment to doing business. It, it ought to be able to help you. And I think there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of movement toward that over the past couple of years, which I'm excited to be. As a small businessman, I see the benefits of that in a, in a big way. Well, the, there's been indications too that, if, you know, when two years ago, when uh, unemployment was 11 points, four percent now it's down to nine point percent still unacceptable but we're a step in the right direction and i think that's due to a lot of initiatives um, you mentioned earlier that one of the key things that the legislature has to do every year is to think about redistricting now redistricting comes you know as a direct result of the census right. and both the house and the senate look at the results and drop their maps now the house seem to have gotten it right the first time out of the shoot because they, their maps that the House drew up uh, were kind of accepted and uh, moved on. Now, that wasn't the case with the Senate, and that ended up in the Florida Supreme Court. What is the status now on the redistricting, and what can we expect in the near future? Uh, as you indicated, the House maps, uh, just, I think, unprecedented almost, approved by the Supreme Court 7-0. Uh, which is very encouraging that, you know, we really worked hard to do the right thing. And, you know, all of the mandates, Amendments 5 and 6 Correct. and the others that we had to, you know, deal with this year with both House, Senate and Congressional. And then Voting Rights Act and minority districts and all of that. There's a lot to it. So it was very encouraging that our maps uh, did so well. The Senate, uh, you know, had a few challenges from the court. I think there were seven or eight. Um, they went back. Uh, we opened up, as you know, uh, a week after uh, session ended, or not quite a week after, the right. Wednesday after session ended, we went back 
to open up a, a special session for the maps. And, and some people say, well, why in the world would you have to go back to Tallahassee just for that, to open up a session? It's largest and it, it's constitutionally mandated. You know, it's, it's, it's um, something that by constitution we have to do. We have to officially open the session so the work can begin. So we opened the session. The committees went to work on the maps. The mm -hmm. Senate went to work on theirs. They passed their maps through mm -hmm. uh, about two weeks ago. We went back, uh, the revised maps. We went back, the House went back last Tuesday and uh, Monday, actually, the committees met, re reviewed the maps, talked about any changes or whatever, accepted them in committee, and then brought them to the House floor. And then Tuesday on the House floor, we had debate, questions, right. answers, debate, you know, talked about some amendments that were filed or, uh, you know, the like, and then passed the maps, the Senate maps through last Tuesday. Mm -hmm. They go back to the courts, uh, the Supreme Court, and they will decide whether or not they've accomplished what the courts suggested in their initial ruling. Uh, and we all believe that they will accept them because, you know, those, those uh, areas those were changes covered. Those where there yeah. were concerns yeah. uh, that have been addressed. They've been addressed, and I think they've been addressed adequately and fairly. And uh, hopefully they will, and I think everybody hopes that, because other than that, the next step is for the courts to uh, draw the lines or, or to address those questions as a court, not as a legislative body. So mm. we all feel that, you know, our job as elected officials is to do the right thing and to get them right. right. So I trust that, that this time the courts will accept them as, as they've been revised and all those, uh, all those issues have been addressed. And it has to happen relatively soon, you know, b before the, the election uh, cycle begins, right. correct? Yes. So we're hoping that a decision comes down from the Supreme Court within I think, it's, weeks, I think it's within a couple of weeks. I, I don't know the exact day from now mm -hmm. because, you know, so a little bit of time has passed, but it's within several weeks that they have to opine on the on the revisions. And you're right, because uh, candidates have to know which district they live in so they can qualify and, and get the paperwork all in line to be able to either run again for re-election or for new candidates that are interested in the process exactly. to be able to file and, and run in that district, whichever it might be. Well, talking about district, let's talk about the uh, 68th, you know, which you might be the last representative of the 68th district because your district now will become? 71. Uh, previously, our district, uh, 68, was northern Manatee County, mm -hmm. west of 41. I had a little sliver of Hillsborough County, and I love telling the story. Our constituent was the, I believe, the park ranger at Egmont <laughs> Key. That was the one... Hillsborough County resident we had in our district, uh, the only one. Um, so now that's moved toward a Hillsborough seat. We've moved a little further south and we take in all of Longboat Key, Lido Beach, St. Armands, Bird Key, really? kind of across the bay, a sliver of Siesta, and then up around a little bit of downtown Sarasota, and then kind of up 41, the museum and new college and, and uh, the west side of 41. So our district had to, by census, um, there has to be 156,000 mm -hmm. residents, plus or minus a few, in a house seat. And our district was about 29,000 short of that number after the new census was done. So we had to grow by 29,000 residents or, or, you know, uh, uh, in, our, in our area. So that's why our district expanded. That must be very exciting, too, because now you have a whole new type of uh, uh, constituency. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Hillsborough County was nice to have in because we're all kind of a region and what's mm -hmm. good for them is good for us. But I feel I'm very excited about uh, Sarasota northern Manatee. Sarasota Manatee because we've always had a, a pretty good synergy and there's a lot going on, you know, across the county lines back and forth in terms of what's good for our community and what's good for business and what's good for families. And so I'm, I'm very excited to have the north part of Sarasota in our new district. Well, hopefully, you know, we can have you back at some other point. We can talk perhaps about some of the efforts that you're making, you know, within the district for this new, uh, this new area that you, you're, you're now representing. Sure. Uh, Representative Boy, one of the key things or a key piece of legislature that came through was House Bill uh, 119, of which uh, you were... Uh, a catalyst uh, due to your background, due to your experience, due to your knowledge of the insurance business. And that is the PIP, uh, mm -hmm. Personal in, uh, Insurance Protection. Tell us what the status of that bill was, because like, remember when you were here, you talked about the, the amount of fraud that was happening throughout Florida, mm -hmm. the cost to consumers, the initiation of your bill, and how that bill is now uh, developed. 
Okay, I'll, I'll give you a little detail if I get if I get too Absolutely. too deep in the weeds. Please just let me know. Um, we started out with 119, the House bill, and the Senate had a had a companion bill, mm -hmm. and we were quite a ways apart uh, in terms of the scope of of you know what the bill accomplished. You, you did mention, and we talked about last time that we were here, uh, fraud in the PIP, and we call it. PIP, you know, a lot of people don't understand, it's personal injury protection, and we started to call it automobile insurance reform because that's, mm -hmm. people understand that a little bit better. But there was a billion dollar fraud component in that, in that uh, coverage. And it's the coverage that you, we as a state mandate you carry mm -hmm. to drive an automobile in Florida. And what drove my passion for this issue and to root out the fraud and to, to try to really get at uh, the problem was the rates over the past two years have gone up 66% for that coverage. Uh, they're estimated to go up by all experts another 30% this year if we did nothing. And the, and the problem, the big, big problem is the people that can afford it the least are the ones that are paying the most. Mm -hmm. The inner cities, the minorities, mm -hmm. the working mom. I'll give you an example uh, of, a, of a number that we saw. A working mom in, a single working mom in Tampa. And Tampa has become the largest fraud community eclipsed Miami and Orlando Girl. over the past year. But a, a single working mom in Tampa that has a just a perhaps even a beat up car, all she can afford to get her kids to school and maybe to the two or three jobs that she has to to do to, to manage to put food on the table, her coverage was costing her fourteen to sixteen hundred dollars a year for ten thousand dollars of benefit. Hmm. That's just criminal. We could not allow that to happen. So the House bill started pretty aggressively at, at refocusing the type of coverage. And in the end, what we did was we said, look, all of these things might be well and good that were covered under, the, uh, under that policy exactly. before, but people just can't afford all those bells and whistles. So our initial bill was just revising the entire concept of automobile, of, of personal injury insurance, mm -hmm. and directed, if you were hurt in an automobile accident, you needed to go to an emergency room. Mm -hmm. So we cut out all the other, you couldn't right. go to your own doctor, you couldn't go, you had to go to an emergency room because if you were hurt bad enough, that's you where you felt like. Right. And the cost by, by the, uh, by the uh, studies that were done, the cost in the emergency room for an emergency room visit. Now a lot of people will say, well, emergency rooms are so much more expensive, why would you do that? Mm. The average cost as documented in the, in the studies was $1,600 per emergency room visit. Mm. Other ancillary providers charges were much more if you got into their system. So we decided that was the route to take. Well, we knew over the course of time, because the Senate was over here and we right. were here, that there were going to have to be some compromises made and some, you know, some movement, hopefully both ways. And a lot happened between the first of the session and the end of the session. And I talked to a lot of people, you know, anybody that had an interest in the issue, I encouraged them to come and talk to us. Mm -hmm. There wasn't one party in one group that I didn't talk to. But I tried to encourage them that, look, you know, we're pretty aggressive right now. The Senate maybe isn't quite as aggressive. Right. We know that at the end of the day, we're going to have some compromise. And in fact, uh, at the end of the day, we did have compromise. And I think it was good compromise. Mm -hmm. So uh, essentially what the bill does now is, and it is, it's passed the House and the Senate. We, right. we, we agreed on the compromise. Both bodies passed it. And it's on the governor's, uh, well, it will, it will be going to the governor. I don't think right. it's made it yet but it will be going to the governor for his signature. And I think he's definitely in favor of it as well. Um, what we did in the end was, it's not just emergency room visit. Now you can go to the emergency room, which if you're hurt bad enough, you should. all of us would and should. But if you're not hurt to the extent that you need an emergency room visit, you can go to your doctor mm -hmm. or DO. You can go to a chiropractor mm -hmm. uh, for $2,500. There's a sub limit for a doctor's visit or a chiropractic visit uh, of $2,500. So for the non-emergency type uh, mm -hmm. situations, you can go to any one of those providers and be treated. Um, so that was a great compromise, I think, in the end to get people that you know maybe aren't banged up bad enough to right. you know need emergency care, they can still go to a provider of their choice to be taken care of. This was an, a key initiative of the governors this year. It was a key initiative of, of our House leadership. Our speaker, Dean Cannon, mm -hmm. was a, a priority of his. Right. And uh, so the CFO as well, Jeff Atwater, mm -hmm. key priority of his. So really it was a collaborative effort. I was, you know, if you will, the ball carrier because I have a little more knowledge of the system maybe They're than some. But um, it, was, uh, it was a collaborative effort by governor, CFO, Speaker of the House, President of the Senate, Senator Negron and myself to, to get something done that will lower cost. And, and the good news is 
the insurance companies that provide this coverage have to refile rates and forms by the uh, December of this year, and they have to have a 10% decrease in premiums this year exactly. in order uh, for them not to go be required to do a full rate review and justification. So I can't speak for the insurance commissioner, but if I were an insurance company, would be an incentive. I would be looking at like, I'm lowering my cost because they've done enough to make this thing, uh, you know, drive drive fraud out of the system and 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 uh, and capture some of those savings in, in in rate reductions. And then by 2014, the rates have to go down 25 percent, or the same review is in is in place. So. Well, those are great steps in the right direction. I remember your conversation, you know, before the session where you talked about the importance and how fraud is like so prevalent. Uh, there are examples of multiple people filing uh, claims that weren't even in the accident. Did, did any of the, the long form uh, things make it into the bill, you know, where you had the like the long form accident report had to be included uh, and those type of things that'll help eliminate that fraud of multiple people claiming multiple multiple injuries as a result of an accident. Boy, Charles, you've got a good memory. Yes, that did that did make it in, and I should have I should have touched on that. But that's a key component of the bill. Um, you know, as we talked about before, you only had to do a short form, which says, you know, I was in the accident, but right. tomorrow Charles and Joe and Pete and Sam could all be in the car, whether they were or not, mm -hmm. and they're filing claims. We also tightened up some. Um, licensing requirements on facilities and exemptions were mm -hmm. were dealt with it. Previously, facilities were exempted. So we're trying to get at it from all mm -hmm. sides. And, um, you know, the reality is those involved in fraud are pretty smart. And they're already, I've already seen a few schemes come across via email of, of flyers and, and the like that have been sent around trying to do an end run on what we're trying to accomplish. But I hope Florida and Floridians will stand up to them just like we're trying to and say enough is enough. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't we don't want this, we won't tolerate it, and we're not gonna allow it to happen. And you know, it's incumbent on us as we see those things happening to report them as well. And there's a division of fraud. There's some component for uh, some more investiga uh, investigations to be allowed. And so there's, you know, there's a lots of different components of this bill, I think, that will get at the problem. Well, hope hopefully, you know, this bill can help eliminate that billion dollars worth of fraud because that impacts across the, the, the every economic spectrum. Um, and I appreciate that update. But one of the other key things that, that uh, is before the governor now is House Bill 947, which relates to violent felons with firearms. And, and uh, this is your bill, Representative. And, and I'd like to know a little bit about not only the scope of the bill, but the genesis of it and how you, uh, why it was important to you. Thank you for asking. It's very important to me. And I, honestly, that was important to me as, as PIP reform. Um, and the reason is this, our society has gotten into a state where people will shoot each other for just no reason. You know, I can remember as a kid growing up in Manatee County, the last thing anybody did, even a mobster, you know, if you kind of conjure up the, the notion of a mobster, the last thing any, anybody did was try to harm a police officer. Now it's almost like a badge of honor to, for some of these thugs to, to shoot and kill law enforcement officers. A year ago when I was in Tallahassee for my first session, a friend of mine from Tampa, Greg Stout, who was a d detective here with uh, Charlie Wells, moved to Tampa police 15 or so years ago and is now with the PBOA in Tampa. He was in Tallahassee and we were talking about this and I said, you know, this is really, really bothering me. Two people, two officers two have officers, just been killed sir. in St. Pete two officers in Miami, there'd been two in Tampa. I said, we just have to do something about this. What can we do to stem that? Not to mention our friends and neighbors and, and people in our community are being gunned down exactly. you know, at random as well. So it really drove me to try to come up with something that, that would be of substance that would get at the problem. So Greg um, said, well, let me, let me give it some thought. I think there's some things with the 1020 life law that we might be able to do. He engaged a uh, state attorney in Tampa, Mark Ober, who was a good friend of his. Mm -hmm. He engaged and, and we did Attorney General Pam Bondi. Um, long story short, the Sheriff's Association, the Police Chiefs Association, the, the Prosecutors Association, General Bondi, uh, and all kind of all of us agreed on some legislation that tweaks the 1020 life rule or law and simply says, if you're a violent felon and there's a category of violent felons, mm -hmm. you know, murders, aggravated assault, and there's 10 or 12, uh, maybe 14 categories. Mm -hmm. If you're a violent felon, A, by law, you're not supposed to have a firearm. It's mm -hmm. against the law to carry a firearm. But if mm -hmm. you are carrying a firearm and you're caught with it for whatever reason, if you're one of those violent felons, 
you go to jail for 10 years, minimum sentence, no questions asked. So to me, that starts to get at at least putting the worst of the worst away, mm -hmm. but also um, maybe acting as a deterrent for those exactly. that might think about picking up a gun, maybe they'll reconsider. Mm -hmm. Now there was one little tweak we had to do at the end because this year was a year, as we talked about at the outset of the show, um, not a lot of money. And there was a physical impact by doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine it costing us something to put the worst of the worst behind bars. But we made a little bit of a compromise that simply said, um, you had to, if you were in that category of violent felons, you had to have a gun in the first felony in order for this to apply. Our original bill was it didn't matter, it didn't matter as long as you were a violent felon. Next year, I hope, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to wear out the speaker on this if we can, that we can tweak it a little more to get that component out. Because honestly, as a taxpayer, as a citizen, I don't mind my money going to put the worst of the worst behind bars, and that's what this bill aims to do. And and, and obviously, you know, that bill is now sitting on the governor's desk, and you know, I'm sure that you know, with the input from the. Uh, police associations throughout the state it's going to be uh, something that he looks at very very carefully I, I, I believe and, and, and congratulations to you for taking that initiative to to, to start that uh, representative Boyd we have only a few minutes left and I want to take a few minutes to kind of um, give you an opportunity to kind of reflect if you if you if I may uh, on those first two years um, Obviously, a lot of the decisions and uh, votes that were taken are, are affecting people throughout the state. Uh, and and I, I'm sure the, the, the type of individual that you are, you know, that's very reflective, a lot of this is, uh, you know, weighs heavy on you. Can you tell us a little bit about your, you know, decision-making process and, and how all of these, from budgets to school teachers to policemen to uh, all of these different things that as a, legislature, uh, as a legislator are affecting? And uh, talk to us a little bit about that process. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, it's a different, a different process than, than you know, maybe what I've been involved in before on, on such a big level. Um, you know, I've grown up here. I'm a businessman. I'm a family man. Uh, I care about people. I care about what happens to people. Um, and then you're, you're, you balance that with the stark reality that as a state, we have X amount of dollars. Exactly. We can't create dollars. We have to budget, balance our budget every year, unlike the federal government. So we have to live within our means. So unfortunately, that means you make tough choices. Uh, have to make tough choices. Uh, when I'm making those tough choices, and there have been some, and there have been some people won't be happy with, and there'll be some that you know others will be happy with. Right. That's just the reality of, of, of this uh, job. Uh, but in the, in the big picture, I try to listen to everybody. My door is always open. Uh, if you're an opponent of what I'm doing, I'll have you in and talk to you. Right. I'll listen to your opinion. I'll listen to, your, to what you have to say. I'll try to tell you why I'm thinking the way I'm thinking. And, you know, some cases there's some compromise and, you know, and some, some work in between that we can, right. we can come to some agreement on. But in the big picture, I do try to listen to what not only is important to uh, each party involved, but also to our community and to our state. You know, we were told when we got sworn in, not only do you represent your community, you're one of 120 House members that represent 19 million Floridians. So it kind of broadens the, the scope of, you know, what we're responsible for. So it, it's a privilege, it's an honor to do it. Uh, I don't take it for granted. I certainly don't uh, expect that, you know, everybody will be happy with what I do. But when you make tough decisions, and sometimes those tough decisions have to be made, I hope that, you know, I, I still will do it in a way that, and I intend to still do it in a way that uh, allows communication, allows conversation about uh, what those issues are in a, in a way that, you know, at the end you may not agree with me 100% of the time, right. but at least you'll understand why I'm making the decision I'm making. Well, Representative Boyd, uh, you know, as you move into the future and into uh, the, the coming years, uh, there, you're going to have a lot of other decisions and hard decisions in front of you. And, you know, we wish you the best of luck and we wish you that you'd come back and kind of update us from time to time on some of the, it, the legislation that's pending, some of the challenges that the state is facing, and also some of those opportunities that the state is taking advantage of. And we deeply appreciate you taking, you know, a few moments out of your time to come here on a METV and kind of tell the community your facts and and kind of enlighten us a little bit about all the processes that have to be gone through to come up with the best possible solutions. Thank you, Charles. You all do a great service to our community. I'll be here anytime you ask. Well, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. 
Representative Boyd uh, can be classified not as a politician, but almost as a public servant. And those are the key elements that separate individuals from doing the best for their community. And Representative Boyd truly fits into that category. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Up Close on METV.